Let's pray. Dear God, we can never thank you enough for your many blessings to us. Father, you bless us so often that many of the blessings we don't even recognize. Sunlight, rain, eyesight, hearing, the ability to walk, the ability to breathe without a machine. We thank you for these blessings, dear God. Ten fingers, ten toes, none of which we'd like to lose. Father in heaven, help us to realize that you are a God of miracles every single day. We just have to open our eyes and see them. Now as we bow in your presence, we ask you to forgive our sins, Father. We recognize you as the great God, and we humble ourselves in your presence. Grant us a consciousness, dear God, that you are near in the person of your spirit. As for me, Father, I humble myself before you in the dust. I really do. Give me the awareness that I am nothing. But Father, use me still. As you made Adam out of dirt and put your image in dirt, put your spirit in me, Father, that the words I speak may glorify your deserving name and the people you love may be blessed. Bless us all. Bless those watching via the internet and a double blessing day, God, on all those with us for the first time. Bless this country of the Philippines, I pray. Grant the leaders wisdom to make decisions that are advantageous to the gospel. Bless every country represented by this congregation, every country represented by those watching via the internet, Father. Keep us faithful in all we do, and when you come into your kingdom, save us, I pray, with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject for this evening, who is on your side? What did I say? Let us go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12, we'll read from verse 7, our subject, who is on your side? Revelation, the last book of the Bible, reading from verse 7. By the way, my good brother, thank you for the violin music. Appreciate that very much. God bless you. And I should also say how grateful I am for all those who sing night after night. I stand in the pulpit and I say nothing, and I'm sorry about that, forgive me, because I'm just focused on one thing that's preaching. But I'm grateful to all those who've sung. I think you've come from, uh, what's the university? Is it called AUP? And uh, the group that sang tonight. But what distinguishes each group is the quality of the singing. And may God bless you wherever you are. Something else about the singing that I noticed, all your music sounds like church music. We live in a time when it's difficult to tell church music from worldly music. But all the music I have heard, it sounds like church music. And may God bless you for that. Revelation 12, reading from verse 7, I read from the King James Version of the Bible. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against a dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, finish the verse, and his angels were cast out with him. There was a war in heaven we don't know how long ago, before the world was made, if you are a believer in the reliable word of God. There were two armies. One army led by Michael, a name for Christ. The other army led by Satan called the dragon, the serpent, and the devil. The Bible gives him four names, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Each one has a different meaning, but combined, they express the kind of person he is. In this battle, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, two sides. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. When you read the words, and prevailed not, it tells you that they lost. They lost. They lost to whom? Come on, loudly. To whom? Jesus, who is called in that passage, Michael. Let me say it again. The very first account recorded in the Bible of a conflict between Christ and Satan, Satan lost. Now somebody ought to say amen. amen. 
because Jesus has not forgotten how to defeat Satan. As he lost then, Christ, when we trust in him, will see to it that in our lives the devil loses again. And so there was a war in heaven. Jesus will fight for you. Nobody said amen. amen. <laughs> Must be sleeping with your eyes open. Jesus will fight for you. Amen. Now, that's way back. Now, let's look at another time when Jesus and the devil met. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10, we'll read verse 2 and 3, then we'll go to verse 12. Daniel 10, 2, 3, and 12, and 13. Our subject, who is on your side? Our theme for this week is what? Freedom from fear. All right. And behold, I, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. By mourning, he meant fasting, crying, praying. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh or meat or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself until three whole weeks were what? Fulfilled or accomplished. Daniel said, I am praying. He was fasting. He was praying. He did not eat. Did not even take a shower. He wants God to reveal something to him. You see, Daniel had seen a vision in chapter 7 and chapter 8, and there were parts of the vision or certain part he could not understand, which is expressed in Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He could not understand that of the work of this mysterious beast called the little horn. So something about the vision puzzled Daniel. He was eager for the Jews to return to Jerusalem. He knew the date was coming up because he had studied the writings of Jeremiah. Now he is told in a vision unto 2,300 days. Daniel wants God to explain this. And so Daniel is praying and he's fasting. Now, Gabriel comes to him, verse 12 of Daniel 10. Then said he unto me, what? Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy prayer, thy words were heard and I am what come for thy words the angel tells Daniel the very first day you began to pray we heard and I was sent but why did he have to pray three weeks verse 13 read with me but the prince of the what kingdom of Persia come on withstood me how long one and twenty days now the person speaking is Gabriel, the highest angel in heaven. What's our subject? Who's on your side? God sends Gabriel with an answer for Daniel. Imagine this. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is a title for Satan, resisted him. Three weeks. Now, if Satan can withstand the highest angel in heaven, it means that Satan has more power than Gabriel. Listen to me carefully. Let me say it differently. Before Satan sinned, he was Lucifer. He was the highest angel in heaven. The Bible says of him, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 28, 12. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. That's a description of what he looked like. By the way, those are 10 precious stones. When you look at the stones on the high priest, he had 13. Lucifer had 10. The high priest represents Christ, which means that Lucifer, before he sinned, looked just like Christ. I went a little quickly. Let me slow down and say it again. The high priest had 13 stones when he was fully dressed, breastplate and shoulders, 13. In the description of Lucifer, he has 10 of those 13. The high priest represents Christ. We can see from that, before Lucifer sinned, when you looked at him, you looked at Christ, you had to look very closely to determine who was who. That's how much he looked like Jesus. In the book, our High Calling, page 66, paragraph 2, 
the author writes these words, God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. Lucifer was the most powerful angel we read in verse 14 of Ezekiel 28. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee. So Lucifer is named, the only other angel named is Gabriel. Lucifer is named, and he is handpicked by God to stand right next to God. That's why he was the highest angel. Now, when he sinned and was cast out, listen carefully to me, he lost his position, not his power. If that's clear, say amen. When he was thrown out, he left with his power, but he vacated his office. Now Gabriel stepped into his office. Desire of Ages, page 693, paragraph 3. The mighty angel who stands in God's presence, occupying the position from which Lucifer fell, came to the side of Christ when Christ was in Gethsemane. Gabriel stepped into the position but did not have the same power. Now, God sends Gabriel on a mission to Daniel. Satan holds him up. What's our subject? Let's go back to Daniel 10. Let's read verse 13 again. But lo, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Pick up the reading now. But lo, come on, Michael, come on, one of the chief princes, keep reading, came to do what? Help me stop. Gabriel said, I needed help. Against whom? Satan. Are you listening? Gabriel needed help. And he said, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. Michael being a name for Christ. If Gabriel needed help, what about us? Do you think you can handle the devil by yourself? You can't. And so Gabriel came to help. Uh, Michael came to help Gabriel. And that's when Gabriel was able to break through. Who was on the side of Gabriel? Tell me. Michael, better known as Jesus. Question for you. Don't answer me. In our daily struggles, who stands on your side? Don't answer me. There was war in heaven, Revelation 12. Michael and his angels fought against a dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. He lost to Christ, that first battle. In his conflict with Gabriel, Jesus came after three weeks and won the battle for Gabriel. Satan lost again. Now, that's before Christ came to the earth, you see. Before Christ came to the earth, he was just God, spirit. When he came to the earth, he came as what? A human being. Ah. Now I can hear Satan saying, aha, uh -huh. you defeated me when you were just God. Let me see if you can do it. Now you're a man. Matthew 4. We read from verse 1. Our subject, who is on your side? Now Christ has placed himself in a position of vulnerability. He is human. And the Bible says he felt our weaknesses. He went through what we went through. <clears throat> so he wasn't pretending to be human. Christ was literally human. He spent nine months in the womb of a woman. Matthew 4, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, what does it say? Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when, let me pause right there. Don't read that verse as if Jesus went looking for Satan. He did not. The devil followed him into the wilderness. No, Jesus knew Satan would come. Jesus did not go looking for Satan. Do not go looking for the devil. You will not like what you find. There are some people in the church who claim to have the gift of deliverance. <laughs> they go looking for demon-possessed people to deliver. Don't do that. Do not 
go looking for demon-possessed people to deliver. If in the doing of God's work, you come across a situation, then you have to act. Are you following me on the authority of God's word? But don't go looking for demons to cast out. All right. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil came with an attack. Jesus responded with the word of God. And so the devil changed his temptations. Then the devil take him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him again, Unto him it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil tried a second approach, and he failed. Third approach, again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, get thee hence Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Read verse 11 for me. Then the devil leaveth him. Satan had to go get a break. Because every time he came at Jesus, Jesus Christ resisted him with the word. And so he backed off. And lo, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, there was war in heaven between whom? Jesus and Satan. Who lost? Well, who won? Jesus. In the battle between Gabriel and Satan, who came to help Gabriel? Jesus. When the devil came at Jesus in the wilderness, did Jesus overcome? Yes. How? Through the Word. And the Word must be truth. Only the Word of truth has power to resist the devil. Let's look at Jesus conquering Satan again. Let's go to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. We read verse 17 and verse 18. Our subject, who is on your side? Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, What? Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, come on, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and death. Jesus says, I was dead. <laughs> Let me say that again. This is Jesus himself. He says, I was dead. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same flesh and blood, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil has the power of death. Death came into the universe because of sin. Sin began with Satan. So Jesus submitted himself to death. Why do I say he submitted himself to death? Go to John 10. Our subject, who is on your side? 7.30 on the dot. John 10, we read from verse 16. God bless those of you taking notes. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading what verse? 16. When you found it, say amen. The Bible says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might do what? Take it again. Now, read verse 18 microscopically. Read with me. No man, come on, taketh it from me. I lay down, come on, of myself. Keep reading. I have power to lay down 
and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus says, listen carefully. Well, let me pray before I say anything else. Let's pray again. Father, give me a fresh supply of your spirit. Please, the spirit of truth. Help me to deliver this message, Father, simply. And enlighten the eyes and the ears and the understanding of those who are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to verse 18 of John 10. No man taketh it from me. I lay down of myself. You see, Jesus gave his life. If someone had just sneaked up behind him and shot him in the back of the head, that's not giving up your life. Are you with me? Jesus consciously, voluntarily, and deliberately gave up his life. I have power to lay down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, Jesus says I have power or authority to give it up and to take it up, meaning Jesus raised himself from the dead. Not the Father. Even though the Bible says that in several places, the Bible doesn't mean the Father raised him. The Bible simply means the Father told him when to get up. There are Bible verses, uh, Acts 17, 31, Galatians 1, 1, Romans 10, 9, that say the Father raised him. What those verses mean, Christ came up at the command of the Father, but Jesus raised himself. Listen to me carefully. If Jesus needed help coming back from the dead, we would have a Savior who needs help to save us. Have I lost you? Listen to me again. See why I had to pray again? The enemy is death. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is the reversal of everything God intended when he made the heavens and the earth. That is the enemy. Oh, death. Where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Death is the enemy. Death is the curse. Death is the condemnation. Jesus submitted himself to that voluntarily. He was dead. That's what he said in Revelation 1.18. Then he raised himself from death. Which means that Christ not only conquered Satan, several times. Christ conquered death. What's our subject? Who's on your side? Do you have the person who can conquer Satan on your side? Who's on your side? Is it that God-man who can conquer death? Is it that God-man who resisted every sin as you and I struggle with this sin or that sin? We struggle, we fall, we fall. Do you realize there is a God-man who has felt what you feel and he has a track record of perfect victory over sin? Who is on your side? If it is Jesus, then you and I ought to experience, what's our theme for this week? Freedom, come on, from fear. If I were going down a dark alley in Manila, I'd like to have Manny Pacquiao with me, not the head elder of the church. Are you with me? Someone who could defend me. I'd like to have a Navy SEAL with me. I'd like to have someone with special forces with me. The SAS from the United Kingdom, some special forces, not a retired deacon. God bless all deacons. Are you following me? Now, earth is a dark alley. Hmm? We need Jesus Christ at our side. And the thing about Christ, he stands on both sides at the same time. <laughs> Somebody say amen. No, I don't know how he does that because he cannot allow any part of us to be unprotected. Christ stands front, back, left, right at the same time. When that's the case, there's no need for fear. We have a Savior. Let me tell you something else about Christ. Listen to this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, Genesis 1. And God said, Let there be light. 
and there was light. Was that God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost? Who said, let there be light? God the Son. Jesus. Now you look at me as if you're saying, explain that. Let me say it again before I explain. It was Jesus, he wasn't called Jesus then, who said, let there be light. It was Christ who said, let there be a firmament, let the waters bring forth abundantly, let the earth bring forth grass. It was Jesus, the creator. That was the same person who died on that cross to be our savior. So Jesus comes to us as creator and savior. Let the Bible show you that it was Christ who said, let there be light. Go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, we'll read from verse 1, our subject, who's on your side, 20 minutes to 8. My friends on the internet, you're still on my mind. God bless you as you follow along with us wherever you are. What book did I say? Hebrews, what chapter? 1, reading from what verse? 1. When you found it, say amen. amen. All right. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Read with me now. Whom he hath appointed heir, come on, of all things, next few words, by whom also he made the world. And so Jesus was the one who created, but he created at the will of the Father. By whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Though we're introduced to the fact or told Christ created. But let's go to verse 8 and find more clearly that Christ is the creator. But on the sun he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, put a smile on my face. Read with me. I beg you every night. Read. Now, keep in mind, this is God the Father speaking. Are you with me? This is God the Father speaking. Here's what he says in verse 10. Read with me. And thou, come on, Lord, come on. In the beginning, come on, hath laid the foundations of the earth, keep reading, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. The Father said, you created. Hmm. Go to John chapter 1. We're, 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 our subject is, who is on your side? You need to understand who Jesus is. John 1. Let's read from verse 1. Oh, you have it? Ah, God bless you. Let's read together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Stop. How many people are in that verse? Two. Let's read again and find out. In the beginning was the Word, uh -huh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have God and the Word. Verse two. The same was in the beginning with God. How many people in that verse? Two. Name them. God and the same. But who is the same? The Word. All right. Two people in verse 1. The same two in verse 2. But listen to verse 3. Read out loud. All things were made not by them. By Him. Not them. Him. Keep reading. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Go to verse 10. He was in the world, not they were in the world. He was in the world, keep reading. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him. Who is this him? Go to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, who became flesh? Father, Son, or Holy Ghost? The Son. And so the Bible tells us it was Jesus who created the heaven and the earth. And now I ask you again, who is at your side? Give me, another, give me a title of Jesus. He is the creator. He died on that cross. He came back from the dead. Give me another title. He is 
savior. He defeated the devil every time they fought. He won. He is the conqueror. This is the man we need at our side. When you have Christ at your side, what's our theme for the week? We have freedom, tell me, from fear. Go to Psalm 118. That's where our title comes from. Psalm 118. Let's read verse 6. Psalms 118, verse 6. When you found it, say amen. What does the Bible say? Notice the first part of that verse and keep our title in mind. What is the Lord is where? On my side. Finish the verse. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord is on my side. How many of you would like Jesus on your side? May I see your right hand? You'd like Jesus on your side, hands down. Do you mean that? Well, how does that happen? How does that happen? We invite him. Listen to Revelation 3, verse 20. Well, go there. Don't just listen. Go there. Revelation 3, verse 20, our subject, who is on your side? If it is Christ, then you have the creator, you have the savior, you have the conqueror, you have the coming king. You have someone who's divine and someone who's human. As a human being, Christ understands your pains, your stresses, your struggles, your sorrows. He understands as a human, but as God, he can do something about it. We have many friends, they understand our aches and pains, they can do nothing. They understand we're broke, they can give us nothing. Jesus understands and can do something about it. Can you say amen? Let's read Revelation 3, verse 20. I ask the question, how does Christ come to our side? Revelation 3, 20, the Bible says what? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Stop. Jesus has already come to all of us. But he has come one millimeter short of entering our hearts. That entrance must be by invitation. Let me say it again. In his humanity, Christ has come right where we are. Now he knocks. If I knock on your door, where do I have to be standing? Right outside the door, not on Pluto or in Quezon City or Visayas. I have to be right outside your door. What does that tell you about Christ? He is right outside the door of your heart. And he knocks. This week of meetings is Christ's way of knocking on the heart of someone. And he may have been knocking for years. Because some people specialize in stubbornness. They try to show God, let me show you how tough I am. I don't care who you send, what you say, how many sermons I listen to, I am not doing what you say. And God in his mercy, he still knocks. Because he knows the alternative to not following him. You know, the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't understand. Tell me John 3.16. Come on. Stop. The whole world? How long has God loved the world? Way back. The God who loved the world sent the flood. Unless you have a different Bible from the one I have. The God who loved the world, what did I just say? Send the flood. Does God love the world, yes or no? Yes. The God who loved the world burned up Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain with fire. One righteous man escaped. The God who loves the world sent the Roman army to destroy Jerusalem, his city. The God who loved the world gave Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2. He gave them up to Nebuchadnezzar because God hates sin. There are two forces in the world that are equal one to the other, I believe. That's God's love for us and his hatred for sin. God hates sin. And he lingers. He lingers. 
He lingers as long as he can. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Go there with me quickly. It's about 10 minutes to 8. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And at the end of the message, which will be soon, I'm going to make a call for those who have not seriously given their life to Christ to do that. Give it to the Creator. Give it to the Savior. Give it to the coming King. Give it to the conqueror of Satan. Give it to the Son of God who is equal with God. Give it to the one who conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, Satan. What book did I say? Second Peter chapter 3, reading verse 9. Read for me. What does that say? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men come slack. In other words, if God promises to do something, He'll do it. But sometimes He lingers because He's a merciful God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Keep reading now, but is long suffering to usward. Ah. Mothers, you understand. You bear with your children. They disappoint you and you love them. They disappoint you. Your son goes off into drugs and you love him. You ask the church to pray for him. You beg the policeman not to lock him up. You love your children. And he's now 46 and he's still disappointing you. Yet you love him. And when you hear he's in an accident, you grab your womb. Why? You persist. You per and you go to your grave loving that boy. Nobody else likes him, but you love him. Now. Nah. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word. Keep reading now, not willing, come on, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not want to lose one person. Go to first Timothy chapter one, chapter chapter two, reading verse one. First Timothy chapter two, reading verse four, sorry. First Timothy two, verse four. Let's read that quickly. Do you have that? Our subject, who is on your side? Our theme for this week, freedom from fear. When Christ is on your side, when you let him in, he's been knocking for years, there's no need for fear. Do we have 1 Timothy 2 verse 4? If you have it, say amen. Put a smile on my face. Read with me. What does it say? Who will have all men to be saved? Come on. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God desires everyone to know the truth because it's the truth alone that makes us free John 8 32 and if the Son shall make you free ye shall be free indeed John 8 36 Christ wants to save every one of us he wants to stand at our side in front of us behind us beneath us above us so that we are protected let me show you the protection God wants to give us Go to Job chapter 1. Maybe this is our last verse. Let me show you the protection God wants to give you so that you can be free from fear. Job 1, reading from verse 6. Our subject, who is on your side? The book of Job in the Old Testament. Let's go to chapter 1. We'll read from verse 6. God bless you for loving God's word. I really mean that. Teach the word to your children, please. It will sustain them when you're not around to tell them what to do. Let me say it again. You won't always be around to tell your children what to do. There must be a power apart from you that will sustain them. That power is the word of God. It will keep your children the way it kept Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, huh? who's that? And Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. The way it kept Joseph amid all the sin and the vice of Egypt. The way it kept the apostles. The way it kept Daniel. It will keep your children if you get it into them right now. What book did I say? Job chapter 1, reading from verse 6. Are you there? Say, read with me. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. That's what Satan came to do. All right. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it, because the world is his, because of sin. Of course, Christ won it back by his death. So it's his legally, but not yet his practically. It is still in the hands of the devil. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Notice verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made, read with me now, a hedge? Come on. 
about him, come on, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Stop. The devil tells God, you have that man protected on every side. I can't get to it. <laughs> oh, somebody say amen. amen. It's such a beautiful thing when the devil is frustrated. He said, you've got that man surrounded. Him, his house, all that he has, his business. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. I can't get to him. My brother, my sister, God is no respecter of persons. The Lord wants to surround you the way he surrounded Job. And God had to open a way to allow the devil to enter to test Job. Who's on your side? Is it really Jesus? Whether you're an old man, an older woman, a young man, a young lady, a child, you need to know that Christ wants to stand at your side. If you're 11 years old, you can have a relationship with Christ. If you're six, you can have a relationship with Christ. If you're 100, you can have a relationship with Christ because he understands. He came as a child, he was a teenager, he was a man, he was an adult. That's the one you and I need on our side. And so tonight, Jesus says, Behold, I stand where? At the door and no. Question for you. Don't answer me. Just listen. Have you been hearing the knocking all week? Let's go beyond this week. Have you been hearing Christ knocking for years but have not opened the door? Tonight, open the door. Let Christ come in. He is your creator. He's your savior. He's your conqueror over Satan. He's your coming king. He is your life. In him we live. Come on. And move. Come on. And have our He is your life. The very life you and I enjoy, the very breath we take, is because of Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And watch your worries and your anxieties subside. Have you ever been drinking from a straw and you watch the thing in the bottle and as you pull, it just drops? Hmm? That's what God wants to do. When you receive Christ, your anxiety, you see it dropping, 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 dropping. Because you see, in the relationship between you and Christ, trust is our business. God is the one to worry, not us. You didn't hear what I said. Let me say it differently. God's job description is worry. Your job description is trust. And so Jesus says, Therefore take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And so Jesus is saying, look, don't worry. Leave the worrying to me. You just trust me. Do what I told you in verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and hold to the other, or hold to one and despise the other. You can't love both. You can't serve both. Jesus says, if you make me your master, don't worry. And tonight, the call comes to us, there's no need for worry. Come, says Jesus. In the wilderness, when the Israelites left Egypt, God took them through the wilderness where there was no food, no water. He sent food from heaven. He sent water from a rock. It was very, very hot. 
He brought a cloud every day to cover the sun. Very cold at night, he placed a pillar of fire in the heavens to warm his people. We serve a God who can meet our needs, but God also has needs. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? We have needs. Money, food, shelter, tuition, whatever. God has needs. One of them is obedience, if not the biggest one. Mm -hmm. You know, we always have prayer requests. Lord, do this, do that. We have a long list, 10 feet long. Do this. God also has prayer requests. Nobody answers them. You know what God's prayer request is? Study the Bible, please. Turn off your phone. Turn off WhatsApp. Read my word. That's God's prayer request. Please return a tithe. That's God praying. Please return a tithe. That's his prayer request. Please, says God, stop working on Sabbath. That's his prayer request. Please avoid sexual immorality. That man is not your husband. That's God's prayer request. Nobody answers them. Then we come to God with a long list. Lord, answer mine. Oh, wait a minute, says God. Wait a minute. Let's be fair. You have prayer requests. I have some. Let me look at yours. Look at mine. What's our subject? What's our theme? If Christ is on your side, there's no need to be fearful. Christ is our freedom from fear. Christ himself. Christ is our holiness. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our power. Christ is our health. Christ is our victory. Christ is our redemption. Christ is everything to us, a man, a person who is also God. And so tonight, I want to ask you, I will ask you, how many of you will say, Father, I recommit my life to you. I want Christ at my right side. Can I see your right hand? I want you to mean it. Don't just raise it to please me. I'll be fine. Stand up with me. I have a second question to ask. Quickly. Listen to me carefully. Listen carefully. Someone listening to me has been resisting the call of the Holy Spirit to give the life to Christ. Listen to me carefully. Someone has been resisting the call of the Spirit of God to give the life to Christ. Put your life in the hands of Christ. There are no safer hands than the hands of Christ. Let Christ lead your life. Someone has been touched but has been resisting that urge. But tonight you will say, Father, I am prepared to surrender my life to Jesus. If there's someone like that, come. Come right here. I'm not talking to all of you. You have been resisting the conviction to give your life to Christ. Notice my words. We have been resisting. The Spirit has spoken, we've resisted. The Spirit has troubled us, we've resisted. Tonight we'll say, Father, I will no longer resist. I am giving my life to Christ. Come. Come. Come a little closer, please. Come. Come right up front, right up front. So I can distinguish you. Come. I am giving the life. I am not resisting anymore. Here is my life. Come. The fact that you're in church does not mean you've given your life to Christ. Mm -mm. The people who said, crucify him, were all in church. Their lives were not in the hands of Christ. My call is, you've been convicted for years perhaps. Surrender the life to Christ. You've resisted. Tonight you'll say, as the Spirit continues to speak, Father, here's my life. I give it to you. Finally, come. Second call, I've been keeping nine commandments, but the Bible says there are ten. Most people keep nine except the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You want God to help you keep all ten, including the Sabbath commandment. You want that help. Come. You want to obey, particularly the fourth commandment. You're keeping the other nine. Like a rich young ruler, God says to you tonight, yet lackest thou one thing. You want to say, Jesus, help me get over that one hurdle. I want to observe your seventh-day Sabbath. Come. It's two minutes after eight. 
I have to delay slightly. Please don't worry. God will make up anything that this extended service may cause in your life. Anybody else? I want to obey God's commandments, all ten, not just nine, ten, including the fourth, which most of the world ignores. Anybody else? Come. Give you 60 seconds and I pray. Come. I made two calls. I've been resisting the conviction of God's Holy Spirit. Now I yield and I give my life to Christ. You ask, how do I give my life to Christ? You just give it. You say, Lord, take my life. Simple. And you say it from your heart. 45 seconds. Second call. I want to obey God fully, including the fourth commandment. Come. I need help. That's why Jesus is all-powerful. He can give all the help we need. But his help must be mixed with a willingness to obey. 30 seconds. Come. While you come, I make one final appeal. Is there someone, you've come all week, even before this week of services was held, you've been considering baptism. You need to make that decision to be baptized into the fellowship of Christ. And you're willing to make it known publicly, but to heaven and earth, that you're willing to be baptized. If there's someone like that, can I see your right hand where you stand? I'm willing to be baptized. Just raise your hand. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just, ah, come, come. Work your way up, come. I need names taken. This is very serious. Somebody come. Here's a piece of paper. Dr. Jim, come and help me. You will to be baptized, come. I want you to come right up. We need the names. Come up with me, Dr. Jim. Come up with me. Come, 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 come. Yes, come, come, come. Baptism, rebaptism, evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. When the soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. I want those for baptism come right up to where I am. I think we can all stand here without collapsing. Come. Come right up. Come right up. I want to see you. I want to distinguish you. Come. Come right up here, right up here, right up here. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Come right up. I'm willing to be baptized or rebaptized. Come right up top, right where I am. The first call was, I'm yielding to the conviction of God's Spirit. Here's my life. Second call, I want to obey God, all ten commandments, especially the fourth, but I need help. And the third call, baptism, rebaptism. Come. If you're coming for baptism or rebaptism, come where I am, right up on this stage. Don't be afraid. Right up on the stage. Let's get all the names so I can have them, I can pray, and the proper plans can be made for you. Baptism, rebaptism. There were 12 disciples in Acts 19. Paul met them at Ephesus. He discovered they knew nothing about the Holy Ghost. Paul taught them about the Holy Ghost. All 12 were rebaptized. Read Acts 19, 1 to 7. But I have to pray. Five after eight. God bless you for your patience. Anyone else wants to say, Father, I've been resisting your spirit. I'm giving my life to Christ. Literally, come. There's no science to it. I mean, no magic. You simply say, Lord, I give you my life. And you mean it. So that he can indwell you and give you the power to live a right life in his sight. Come. There's a call for baptism or rebaptism. Come. Those are the names we want. But I have to pray. But while I'm praying, you may come under the protection of the prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the tireless work of your spirit. One of his functions is to convict and convict and to trouble the heart and to trouble that person who keeps resisting. We thank you for his work. We thank you for those who've yielded to that conviction, dear God, and who have come in this building and those via the internet who have also made a commitment to be baptized or to give their lives to Christ. Father in heaven, I'm asking you now in the name of Jesus, grant to those who've come for baptism and to give their lives to Christ a measure of your spirit, dear God, a measure that's so powerful that no force on earth will change their minds from the decision they have made tonight. Because they will run up in opposition from family, from friends. But Father, give them that spiritual strength. Give them a spiritual spine of steel that will not break or bend. I ask you to bless them. 
And for that man, that woman who's still resisting their God, not because the person is so bad, but because the person is weak at this point, Father, give that person no rest until the person yields to the conviction of your spirit and gives the life to Christ. Now, Father, let every man, woman, boy, and girl in the building and via the internet sense your presence right now. Ah, God, help us to understand we're living in a world that does not have much longer to go. And things are going to get rough quite soon. We must have a place of safety now. And that place of safety is in the arms of Christ and Christ at our side. We thank you for your word, dear God. We thank you for the conviction of your spirit. And as we prepare to leave, let angels take every person safely home. Watch over us as we sleep. Bring us back tomorrow night to hear your word again. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen.